Welcome to Yugo's Desk. Today's episode is sponsored by Action VFX, the best place to get high quality stock footage. I've been using Action VFX for five years in game cinematic short films, trailers, and commercials. They are by far the best stock footage I've ever used in production. Be sure to check out their Black Friday sale where all the effects elements will be 55% off on the first 24 hours. Please visit actionvfx.com to learn more. And now on to the show. This is Nuke for Dummies, so keep in mind it's a beginner's course, you know. This is part three. So, but uh, this was the shot we were kind of like doing uh, last time. Well, we're not doing it. We were just, you know, last time on part one and part two, we kind of talked about, you know, we, we kind of talked about um, uh, merging and we talked about how Nuke renders and we we went through, through over through a lot of things. Like we talked about the interface, we talked about the navigation, nodes and versus layers. We talked about the timeline tools, the settings, the formats. All that was on part one, you know. Then on part two, we kind of talked about rendering and exporting. We talked about AOV, uh, you know, how they are set up. And then we also talked about merging and blending mode. Obviously, this is a beginner score, so I'm really going to beginning. You know, it's really, really, really the beginning. Um, so, and today, the idea would be that we would talk about pre-multiplication rules, which are incredibly important for compositing. Uh, in Nuke especially, and also in any software. The pre-multiplication rules you're going to see today... They are also incredibly important on Fusion or in After Effects or in, on Shake or whatever you use for compositing. Even if you use Blender, you know, like, it's fine. You can also use the same knowledge of pre-multiplication. Pre-multiplication rules are a gener generic thing, really. And so if we have, if we then have time, we're also going to talk about grading and matching layers. So pre-multiplication, what is pre-multiplication? Why do we care? Why do we want to know anything about pre-multiplication? Pre-multiplication is something that a lot of people ignore um, and to your, to your own peril, because the problem with pre-multiplication is that it can develop quite a lot of nasty edges, like black edges and also white edges if it's done incorrectly. And so let's talk about why, in fact, what is pre-multiplication even from the ground up. So let's look, for example, at a render here. So if I look at the, let's see here, anyone will do, let's look at this guy here. So this is a render from a CGI trailer I did a long time ago. Um, and for some reason, Nuke is uh, misbehaving. Sorry about that. So this is like a CG guy. Uh, it's supposed to be Loki. Um, you know, it's like rendered in Redshift. And so this is like a, a, a render that comes from Redshift, right? Like we've we've talked about this before, and and in fact, like the only channel that this thing has, like we talked about before on the other streams, is that it has an alpha channel. So, you know, if you press A, you can see the alpha channel. And so this is what the pre-multiplication part comes around. So the word pre-multiplication comes from the fact that you are multiplying an image. Okay, and what does that mean, multiplying an image? Multiplying an image means that I am multiplying a value of white by the value of color or a value of black by the value of the color, okay? So let me show you what I mean. So for example, by, by using a really, really, really simple example of something like that. So let's, for example, look at this piece of footage. So this piece of footage is a piece of footage that from a from a from a, a, um, a, f a short film we did at the mill that I supervised. So this is for BBC God Only Knows, and this is like a, a green screen, a pretty badly uh, lit green screen. But we were quite in a rush on set, and as you can see, it's a pretty hard thing to key. A lot of blonde, a lot of transparency, but you know it's not too hard to key. I already have a pre-key here, which is a mask. This was done by Trace VFX, which is a company that uh, used to help us at the mill. And so this this mask is a black and white mask of this woman, you know, with a horse. So of course, white means opaque. And I know that for some of you, this is really like this. This is um, uh, really like um, you know, um, this is like really basic. I know for some of you. Um, but, you know, we, we are going to go through this since this is a basic course. 
Um, one little small note. I notice a lot some people asking questions on the on the chat. Please remember that we're only going to answer questions on the break. So I'm going to do this part without interruptions, and we're going to do the questions in the break. So I'll go through the questions and I'll answer everyone. Okay, but just keep that in mind. Don't don't think that I'm ignoring you. Please don't. So white for transparent. Like if you think about alpha channels, white is for fully opaque. Black is for transparent. And so what does what does that mean? That means that when you have these two images, let me just uh, copy these two things here. And if you look at here, so this image here, the way that you would basically cut this woman with this alpha channel would be by using, by basically, first of all, putting that mask into the footage and then using something we call a pre-molt. So Nuke has two things. It has one thing called the pre-molt and it has the other thing which is called the un-pre-molt. So these are the two nodes we're going to talk about now for a while. Um, and so first things first, how do we bring in this alpha channel? Either we've made a key or this was rotated by someone else. How do we bring this in into this footage? Well, we use something, we already discussed the copy and the shuffles. We're going to use something called the copy node. The copy node, just like the name says, it serves for you to copy stuff around. And in this case, I'm going to plug, just like the merge node, I'm going to plug the B pipe into the footage, which is the basically the, the master. It's basically the background here, which is B. And then, you know, the A will go to the alpha channel that we are trying to bring in. Uh, so I'm just going to do this. And what happens here now is because I did a copy, just like the, the name here says, Nuke has a lot of things that kind of show on the interface. And you can kind of see here that it has an A and a B. And you can kind of see it says copy alpha to alpha. So that means I'm copying the alpha channel from A into the alpha channel of the background, which is B. And that's what it says. That's why you have a little arrow here explaining to you what's copying. Now, you need to double check if this piece of footage that was done by Trace, the, does it have an alpha channel? As you can see, it does not have an alpha channel because Trace rendered it just on the red channel. So we do need to go to the copy node here and change that from the incoming footage, instead of wanting the alpha channel, we want the red channel. And on the output two, it's going to be alpha. So that's what we are now doing. And now if I look at the footage and I look at the result by pressing one. So remember, we talked about this on the interface before. We just press one on the viewer to kind of like see the result of my copy node. Um, and so basically what we do here is if I press now by viewing it through the copy node, if I press on the A button, you can see the alpha channel is there. Obviously, this is not enough. I know Nuke always, you know, you guys are all used to After Effects and this and that, but I know Nuke becomes a bit more, you have to click on more things. I understand that. But that's because you want total control on compositing, and that's why you have to click on so many things, and that's why it's not as, uh, we would say, straightforward as After Effects, you know. But obviously, being so straightforward as After Effects has, not this, not ditching After Effects, of course. I like After Effects, but it becomes a bit more problematic if you need to do something more custom made. You know, so that's kind of the problem here. That's why we have to do so many steps. So once this is copied, now I need to use this node here called the pre molt. And if I plug in this this node here, I'm now going to pre multiply that image. Now I know this word pre multiply. What does that mean? Well, this comes from the merge node operation of multiplication, and also it comes from the mathematical equation of multiplication when you multiply a value by another value. So what is happening under the hood, really? If you, if you, uh, you know, like, if you go for, you know, look at this image here, and you look at the original image. And if I zoom in really, really deep here, and let's say, for example, that I have my mouse over the green screen here, and you can kind of see that I can sample them by using uh, the command uh, shift button here. And you can see the values here. I have values of, of 0, 1 of red, um, you know, um, uh, basically, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in front of it, so I need to like zoom in to show you. So I have 0, 1 of red, 0, 2, uh, 4, of green and 006 of blue. See, these are the pixel values. And when I multiply an image, I'm multiplying the alpha channel by this value. So 
in a way, when you look at the alpha channel, uh, you know, when you look at, let's see here, bring in the alpha channel. Uh, when you look at the alpha channel here, what do you see on this alpha channel? You basically just see pure white and pure black, right? So that means that the value of one, which is the pure white, will be multiplied by the value of the color. And so, of course, if I multiply one by one, I get one. Nothing changes. And that's why white is opaque. It, it becomes not trans, translucent. White is white. And that's why the alpha channel is white. So I multiply one by one and it becomes one. But if I multiply the zero, the value of zero by one, then I get uh, zero instead. So the whole thing with this is that what's happening under the hood is that my pre-multiplication is nothing more than me multiplying the value of one by the values of the colors and multiplying the value of the colors of the plate by the value of the blackness of that alpha channel. And then obviously the transparency bits, which if you look, for example, closely here into, if I zoom into an edge, you can kind of see that I have a fall off, the fall off on the edge. The reason I have a fall off is because obviously it's anti-lays the edge. It's like it's not sharp because nothing is really sharp. You always have like an edge. So obviously when you look closely here and you look at my pre-multiplication, that's exactly what's happening here. So my alpha channel, you see, if I look at my color values here, this is the, 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 the result of my pre-multiplication, which has the greens. If I look at the alpha channel, you can kind of see that the value of gray is the multiplication through that color. And that's why when I, when I multiply this kind of gray pixel here by the green that I had there. So if I look at the original here, for example, and I look at the result, so for example here. So if I look at the original, this pixel here, so let's look at this pixel, which has a value of 0, 1. And then if I look at the alpha channel, which is here, the alpha channel has a value of 0, 3, 0, 6, 0, 0, 6. And so the result would be this tonality of green, because the green, which was really bright, gets multiplied by that gray, and then it gives you this kind of like dark green. That's what pre-multiplication is, okay? I hope I was understood. I hope it's clear for you. If it's not clear, of course, you can ask me on the, on the, on the chat as well. And just to prove you that, just to show you how simple this is really in pre-multiplication, I'll show you like another way of doing this. If I use a merge node, and I use like basically an operation which is a multiplication operation, and I merge the multi, I multiply one by the other, I get exactly the same thing. You see, so copying and using a premult will give you me this, give me the same result as using a multiplication operation on a merge node, and the same thing goes for the unpremult, which is what we would consider an, a divide, a division. So that means I'm dividing the alpha channel by the color. I hope everyone is, you know, I hope everyone here is fully following. Yes, I hope so. So, moving on, this is the pre-multiplication. Now, obviously, this piece of footage, which was filmed on a real camera, doesn't have an alpha channel. So, this image would not be pre-multiplied already. It would not come pre-multiplied, as we usually say. Now let's look at a piece of CG because CG is a different beast altogether. So this is a piece of CG from, from Arnold. And as you can clearly see, if I press the alpha channel, there's already an alpha channel and the image actually has been pre-multiplied already. So that means that this image already has been multiplied by its alpha channel. It's already been multiplied by the same values that I just mentioned. I know this why, because if I zoom in real close, you can kind of see that all the edges have actually different tonalities of gray. This is like an all mark of being pre-multiplied. With this, you know that everything is pre-multiplied. Um, you know, so keep that in mind. Um, anything that comes from CG normally is pre-multiplied already, which means you do not need to multiply it again. And that is why when you have a piece of CG, if I merge it directly, I can just merge it directly into my background. You know, I don't need to do a pre-multiplication. In fact, I can just like disable all this thing. And you see is merged there, uh, is completely merged because I, I don't need to pre-mult. The same way if I pick up this guy here and I go back to this uh, to this woman here, 
and I now, let's say here, this is the merging of what we were doing. And if I now put a merge node here and I merge the guy over there, it happens as well. You see, I don't have to do a pre-molt. It'll show up on the scene because the CG has been pre-multiplied. Now, why is this important? That's the thing, you know, isn't it? Like, why, why am I even discussing this? Why are we even talking about this? Well, pre-multiplication has two, I guess more than two, but there's at least two really important things that you need to do with a pre-multiplication operation inside of Nuke. The first one is what we just did here, which is to use alpha channels to multiply. So basically we're cutting, basic cutting with a scissor, anything that we've keyed or, or rotoscoped. So that's, you know, what we do with the pre-molt first. That's the first thing that we do with the pre-molt. The second thing we do with the pre-molt is to deal with any kind of color correction as well. And, why is this important? And um, the reason why this is important is for this, for example. I'm going to give you an example here. Look at this, this small, simple composite that I have prepared here for us. We have the woman over a green screen, and then we have the alpha channel, right? So far, so good. We then copy it to the red channel into the stream, and now we have the alpha channel on our nuke stream. Once we are there, we then can pre-molt the image because we're going to comp we're going to composite it on this background okay so that's the objective is to composite that woman on this background so we did a pre-molt so that she is actually without an alpha channel just like the cg you just saw and then you know we're going to do a couple of other things let's say that for example we do a, a spill suppression because as you can see here she has a lot of green on her hedge so this is a typical process that we do in compositing. We're not going to discuss how to do how to do uh, color spilling today uh, or keying spilling, but you know this is a spill suppression is a part of compositing that we deal with to deal with stuff like this when we have a lot of green edges uh, or green transparencies on our green screen. So we do we use kill, uh, spill suppression to remove that, and there are like a bunch of of gizmos that you can install for free by going to Wikipedia, which is a website where you see all these gizmos, and just go there, and there's a bunch of, uh, of kill spills. The one I usually use, I mean, I've used a lot of them, but this is the one, one of the ones I use, uh, which is the PXF kill spill. So it's a good one. I use that all the time. And then, you know, I'm going to do a bit of a color correction on her. Anything will do, really. This is just a pretend color correction so that I can... And then I merge her completely on top of the image. Now... Notice how, at first glance, it looks fine. I mean, obviously, the color correction doesn't because I'm exaggerating to show you the problem. So, obviously, I wouldn't darken her so much because she's not feeling integrated. But keep in mind that I'm just showing you this as an example. Now, just notice if I zoom in into the edges. Notice how I have this really subtle black edge around her. And I know, I'm sure you've noticed this thing before, You've noticed that before, like on maybe After Effects or even noticed that maybe on Photoshop or Fusion or any other application that you use, you notice that you start doing color correction and you start developing this really weird black edge. And the reason for that is because when you are effectively doing a color correction, so if you look at this color correction, notice how if I look at the edge, notice how the color correction is so extreme that I'm actually color correcting the edge as well. And now when I'm color correcting the edge here, you know, notice how it doesn't it doesn't match the alpha channel. So this was the original edge that I had, and this is the color corrected edge. So you see, if I don't put color correction and I go to my alpha channel, I know that my last pixel is this one. You know, the last pixel of my edge is that one. If I now go back to my color correction, you see that that is now gone. And that's why you have a black edge around your frame, around your comp. You have a black edge because you didn't deal with one of the most important rules of color correction inside of Nuke, which is for you to pre-multiply and unpre-multiply your assets and your layers before you do any type of color correction or spill suppression or anything at all. Now, remember, this is a beginner's course, so we're going really, really beginning. 
I'm sure you, some of you are bored out of your minds on your on, on your on, on the stream here, but you know, like I'm trying my best to kind of like um, uh, explain this really really easily. So the methodology for you to getting rid of this edge would be for you to do something we call the unpremultiplication. What is an unpremultiplication? So if you look at this image here. That's pre-multiplied because I can see the edges are like that. So let's let's go back real quick here, just just for a second, to our friend here, the CG friend. So I'm going to gamma up, and you can see that his edge is pre-multiplied. Now the unpremult, both by the way, both nodes will be found inside the merge uh, node operation. So if you go into the merge menu here, we have all the types of merging operations we can have. And obviously, in here you can kind of see that we have, you know, um, you know, we have like the premult, which, as you can see, here's an X with an alpha, so it's multiplied by the alpha. The logo actually just shows that, so multiplying by the alpha and dividing by the alpha, so that's the premultiplication, and that's the unpremultiplication. For those of you that come from Shake, you remember that there was a divide in Shake, and also in Photoshop, there's a divide. The divide would be what an unpremultiplication is. That's why you have a division button there. So, going back to this thing, when I use an unpremult, this is what happens. Notice how we basically are extending the edge. Now, we are extending the edge to the maximum amount of pixels that the CG computer or the CG renderer actually rendered this scene. I'm just going to gamma up because we can hardly see this edge. I'm going to just like gamma up and f-stop up. And if you go closely here, see... The anti-aliasation of Arnold basically did this really smooth edge by doing high quality rendering, but those pixels still exist. So if I divide my alpha channel by the, the pixels of, of the beauty, I then get this. I get the full edge. And now this is the untreated edge, completely unantialized. It's not antialized at all. It's completely fully visible at all times. And the methodology behind this would be that now I can do whatever color correction I want because the, the color corrector node or the grade node will not affect my edge. It won't shrink my edge. It, it won't make my edge smaller like you saw there. So I'm going to go back to the woman on the trampoline or wherever this is. Um, and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. So, um, you know, so if you look in here, there's two ways of solving this. So if you look in here, I pre-molted, and then I did the color correction, and then I merge, and that's why I developed a black edge. Now, one way of fixing it, this, is to either... There's a complicated way, which I just want to show you just to see what happens. So if I put an unpremolt node here, notice, like, I did the pre-molt, right? But notice if I put an unpremolt, I now have the entire edge completely non entialized So this is the full edge, this is not the original footage. This is the full edge that I had. So this means now that uh, because I have the full edge, I can now do my spill suppression, removes all the green. I can now do my color correction, which removes and darkens the image quite a lot. But notice how if I remove this and premolt, notice how my color correction was affecting and effectively shrinking the edge of my, my layer. Now... Because I've put the end pre-multiplication, now the color correction doesn't do anything. The edge maintains exactly as it is. And now what happens is that now if I merge it against the background, it won't work, of course, because now I have to pre-multiply it again. So after I do the pre after I do the color correction, I put a pre-mult after. So that means that my color correction would be protected basically by using an end pre-mult to extend the edges, do my color correction and then pre-molt again, and then merge. And now, all and behold, you see that there's no black edge. So if, if I now remove these two nodes, that's the black edge that we were talking about. I know this is really hard to see on the stream, and hopefully you can see it on the stream, but you can kind of see that that's the difference of respecting the rules of pre-multiplication or not respecting the rules of pre-multiplication. Now, this is effective for Photoshop, for After Effects, for Premiere, for anything you do that has an alpha channel or that needs to actually have some kind of pre-multiplication. Anything at all will do that, okay?
So I, I hope that that is fully understood, and I hope that you guys are kind of like understanding that. Now, obviously, I wouldn't do it this way. This is a bit too complicated to do it. So I'm going to show you what exactly should have happened. So what should have happened is this. Because this is a green screen, we then have, we copy in the alpha, but we don't promote yet. What we do, the best methodology would be for you to first dispel so that you remove all the green screen, all the green that's still there. Then you do all your color correction and then you pre-molt and then you merge. So that would be the optimal methodology of doing this. This would be the optimal, you know, the optimal uh, pipeline. The way I was showing you was just to show you what it does. In fact, in this situation, we never need an unpremolt because we already have the unpremolt. This is what the unpremolt is. This is an image which is unpremultiplied, which is the footage. The footage has no premultiplication. It has no alpha, so obviously it's not premultiplied. So I, on these situations when I'm using footage or if I'm using alphas or if I'm using keying or if I'm using roto, I don't need to care about the unpremultiplication bit because I already have the image unpremultiplied. So that's why I, I, on that situation, I hope I didn't confuse you, but I was just showing you the fact there. So if you look at the two comps, I've made them one in green and one in red. So the correct way would be this way, you know. Um, yeah, I know someone is saying I asked too early. Yes, you did ask that question, but remember that we are 30 seconds behind on the stream. Uh, it has about 30 seconds delay. <laughs> so as you can see here, when you look at the pre-multiplication, the green one, you see this is the correct methodology. This obviously is not a complete comp. This is just an example comp, okay? But as you can see here from here, we have our footage, our alpha. We copy in the alpha channel into the footage. We then do spill suppression, color correction, and then we do pre-molt, and then we merge it against the background. This is the wrong method. The wrong method would be to do a pre-molt first, then the spill, then the color correction, then the merge. So that would be incorrect to do that. Now, there is a couple of exceptions here that you can also do. There's other ways of doing this. So give you one example of this. So if I put, let's see if I this if I decide to put this color corrector after the pre-molt, let's do that. Or or let's let's like forget about the spill and let's just, well, let's not remove it because I, I'm going to need it later, but uh, let's forget about the spill. And so let's say here that I still have this, I still pre-molt, I still call it correct, and I still merge. Now I have my black edge again. So if you don't want to deal with unpremolt and unpremolt and put in your pre-molt, there's another way, there's a secondary way. If you open up a color corrector or a grade node or any node that has color correction, so I'm going to open up a grade node as well for you to see what I mean. Any node that deals with color correction has a built-in pre-multiplication methodology. So if you look closely to the grade node here, if you zoom in, you see that the grade node says unpremolt by something. So it is essential that you could also do this. You could also say the unpremultiplication is happening in the node. So instead of having premolts and unpremolts outside, you can also do them inside the node. You just have to remember to do it, of course. The same goes for this color corrector here, which is the one we're talking about. If I open this up and I put alpha channel, I'm now saying that this color corrector is now happening before my premultiplication occurs, which means that the premultiplication happens you know, after the color correction. And so if I now look at that, you'll see that this also effectively fixed the edge. If I untick the box of unpremultiplication, you can kind of see that that also solves the problem. So again, like always in Nuke, you always have a lot of ways of doing the same thing. And I know that sometimes it becomes a bit uh, confusing and I, I understand that sometimes it becomes a problem. But keep in mind that this is for your own good. Nuke is very flexible and very complete and... That's why you have so many options, because then you have a lot of ways of fixing things, okay? Hopefully, you're all following me. I hope so. If you're not, you can always watch this again. Uh, it's not a problem at all. Um, so, now, the thing that I would say is that I don't work like this. You know, that before you guys ask that, I never work like this. I never work with the unpremolt ticked box on. 
The reason for that is because I prefer to see a visual representation of my pre-multiplication affairs. I prefer to know what I've done. I prefer to see exactly what I've done. I prefer to have a pre-multiplication. So, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean with that. So look at this character here. So if I don't put, let's say that we look at this background. So this is like a sky background, a matte painting by the lovely David Gibbons. So let's say that this background, which is a matte painting, um, you know, and then we have the CG from Arnold here. Let's say that we are merging them together here. So if you look closely, this looks fine, right? It looks fine. Like we have several color correctors. We have, you know, um, sorry, it's not this one. I should have, uh, sorry, this one here. So if you look in here and you look at that one, it looks fine, right? You think it looks fine. Um, but you see in here, I'm not, all my color correctors have no unpremulted by boxed on and I have no unpremults and no premults. So if I look closely, if I zoom in, let's zoom in to the edges of our image. So let's say, for example, that I go in here to the this one here. So let's compare this one with that one. So this is the correct one and this is the incorrect one. Notice how because I ignored the pre-multiplication rules, I now have an overexposure on the fur. The reason I have that is because the Smith transparency of the alpha is breaking up between the grade. And that's not the only place where we have issues. We have issues at the wells. Obviously, we are now literally pixel fucking. But notice also how we have tr like discrepancies on the color correction of the background as well because they're spilling of, of color correction into the background now. So now effectively, I'm actually changing my alpha, my, my, my matte painting. Not that it looks bad, it, it looks fine, but this is not the correct way to do it. And why, why is this happening? Like, like that's what you probably would have asked. This is happening because of this. Like if you look at this fella here, Locky as he's known, and if you look at this fella here, you look at the color correction that I've done, all looks fine, right? But then notice how when I start doing color correction, notice because I didn't respect the multiplication rules, I didn't respect the alpha channels at all. Notice how, you know, this last color correction is actually changing changing the black to gray. And then because that's there and because my alpha channel doesn't have that at all, that gray of the background that should be black is now spilling into my merge, like it's spilling into my matte painting. Notice how that is now affecting the matte painting for no reason whatsoever. And that's a mistake. That's a Usually a, a rookie mistake, this is mistakes that are usually done by juniors and usually done by people that don't really understand fully the pipeline and the node uh, graph. So, so that's kind of like what I wanted to show you another example. So, and I, in this one, I actually have three examples, you know, I have, um, you know, three examples here. I have one, which is with the pre-molt and pre -molt technique that I showed you. The other one is to actually activate the unpre-multiplication tick boxes inside each uh, color corrector. And then this is the incorrect way, which is just to ignore and be like, oh, 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 whatever, I don't care about anything. Obviously, if I look at the first two versions, the one with the unpre -molt and the pre -molt, they fully work completely. So these ones, as you'd see on by this thing, Every single of these color correctors is tick boxed with this unpremolt tick box. Now, as I mentioned, this is correct, a correct way of working, but I don't like working like this because it can lead to mistakes because you don't really know that they are unpremultiplied. I prefer to be more clear and organized on my comps. I prefer to actually see what I'm doing. I prefer to create a safe area. Let's, people like to do that, uh, like to, to call it, this is a safe area for you. So this, let's, let's imagine that this is a safe area for the pre-multiplication. It's gonna put a little backdrop here. So this is a safe area. <laughs> so um, not, not joking, of course, but um, you know what I mean. So, um, so this would be a safe area here for my color corrector. And I'm just gonna like open up the unpremolt and then the safe area here, which is here. 
I'm just doing this for kicks just to show you. But this is why I want to kind of like explain to you that I prefer to do pre-molt and pre-molt because then I, first of all, create a safe area, which now I can merge things, I can roto things, I can key things, I can do whatever I want here because it's my safe area, right? Now, if I look at my footage by unpremolting, what I'm effectively doing is extending those pixels all the way to the edge. So I'm now extending them. That means I can do my color correction, I can do my grade, I can do my, my whatever I want. You see, I now have gray spilling out. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all because I have a pre-molt after. So as long as I have an unpremolt, color correct everything, and then I pre-molt back again, now, of course, you need to be careful that none of these color correctors need to be affecting the alpha channel. You need to make sure these color correctors are only affecting RGB. They cannot affect the alpha channel. Otherwise, your alpha channel will be contaminated. You need to be careful with that. So, and then this goes in and gets merged. And now we are not affecting the background. So if I disable these two pre-mold nodes, you see that now not only I'm affecting the background, but I'm actually also overexposing defer as well on CG. So so to answer you, some of the questions on the chat, like I don't like to tick box the box on pre-multiplication. I prefer to have a visual cue of what I'm doing, you know. That's kind of like what I what I uh, what I would prefer and I think is the best way for you to kind of work. Okay, so let's let's move on and show you a couple of more examples. Let me just show you a couple of more examples before we move on to another topic. Um, so let me show you, for example, this. So this is from the mill. Uh, this is uh, uh, a long time ago. This is almost almost ten years now. This is a CG uh, production that I supervised at the mill called How the Hummingbird. Um, it was almost ten years. I think it was like nine years or eight years ago. But it doesn't matter. It's still relevant to show you what it is. Can't believe we were using Arnold zero point something, <laughs> which is not even version one back then. That's how old I am, okay? That's how old how old I am. <laughs> I'm very old. So show you the example of this thing. So here's a CG example. We have a background, which is a sky. We have, um, you know, a beauty, which is that one, which is basically just like the birds. There is, of course, a bunch of AOVs and passes, but we're not going to deal with that now. And then I merge it. So now notice how if I don't put those pre molts and unpre molts that I mentioned. So you see, this is the bird. I unpre molt. By unpre multiplying, you see, I am effectively extending the motion blur bit. So this is an example to show you what happens when you have a lot of motion blur on an image. So this is pre baked motion blur rendered in Arnold. And so I'm unpre-multiplying it, so now I have the full edge. I can see the entire thing, and then I can color correct it, and then I pre molt it back again, and then I can merge it. So if I don't respect the pre-multiplication rules, you know, if I disable them, just uh, going to show you here. Notice how, I know it's very subtle, but notice how the actual edges are changing. It's very subtle, but you notice here. Notice how now I have a white edge. This is not supposed to be there. This highlight is not supposed to be here. Um, and this happens on other places as well of the image. Notice here, there's like a slight shift. And if you look at the the this here, so notice how, how by not respecting the pre-multiplication, now I have an overexposed, um, I can't remember the name of this thing, I guess the, the mouth is not called a mouth. It has a specific name. I forgot the name. doesn't matter. So this is like, like I know that <laughs> I know this is boring as hell. I understand that. <laughs> like, oh, great. I went to the stream of Hugo and I'm learning about pre-multiplication. And I know pre-multiplication is an incredibly boring subject and it's an incredibly boring thing. But the reason why I'm teaching you on the Nook for Dummies and why I think this is a beginner's thing is because I've supervised dozens of productions in my lifetime and I always notice that juniors and people that are still learning don't know these little things and that's why and then they spend hours, you know, what usually I've seen I've even seen mid-level composers doing this as well. I've seen Composers, really people that that comp for a living for a long time, 
struggling trying to find why do I have an overexposure and then they go through the comp and then they call a correct it. I've even seen people, you know, when you look at the example of the woman here, you know, the, the bad example with the, the edges, I've seen people seeing these black edges and doing something really nasty, which is to get an edge, like an erode node, you know, basically just basically go to an erode and try to erode that edge, you know, like they go in here and then they start trying, okay, can I get rid of that edge? Okay, I'm going to get rid of the edge. Okay, I've done it. I've done it. No, it's not completely get rid of Okay. So then they start putting an erode to try to get rid of, of something that was a mistake. So if you don't respect the problem multiplication rules, you then end up trying to troubleshoot problems. And obviously, if you put this erode here, yeah, you can fix it. And you see, I fixed that edge, but it's not the correct thing. That's the thing. And if I look at the hair, the erode broke other things. Look, notice how I've lost hair detail because of the erode. So now, you, because you didn't respect the pre-multiplication rules, you probably thought, oh, okay, well, I put an erode. Oh, shit, now I have the hair is gone. So now... I have to put another, ex I have to now key this section separately to try to recover it. And you're now just on, on, a, on a snowball. You're basically on a, on, a, on a can of worms. You're just going and fixing. So instead of working, you're fixing. You're just plumbing. You're doing plumbing, you know. So that's why I think it's so important for you to kind of like learn the basic, basic, basic methodology and mathematics of multiplication in division. I'm dividing the pixels by the white mask, which is an alpha. I'm multiplying the pixels by the white mask, which is an alpha. That's the key thing here. And, and another thing that I would say as well that I need to tell you is that this effectively also uh, works for also the footage itself. So imagine this piece of footage, for example, is in Simeon color space. You need to be careful as well because the color space that you bring in on a read node will also be affected by the pre-multiplication rule. And that's why there's a button called pre-multiplied next to the color space. So let's assume, for example, that we got a render in Alexa log for some reason. I don't know why you do that, but because this is not a problem with linear. If you use linear, this is not an issue. But let's imagine for a moment that someone gave you a CG on Alexa V3 log, which is incorrect for this footage, but, you know, let's imagine that this was happened. If this already had an alpha channel, you would have had to say, it already, if it would have already been pre-multiplied, you would have to, un to click the pre-multiplication button already. Let me show you what I mean, because uh, a color space is a color corrector. Don't forget that. It is a color corrector. So if I look at this piece of CG, this piece of CG, of course, is linear. As always, it should always be linear. But let's suppose that you have a crazy person on your on your mist and they've done an Alexa V3 log C um, render for some reason. If this has been pre-multiplied already, you then have to tick this box for the edges to show up. You see, notice like how the edges are not showing up here. So you need to kind of be careful with these kind of things. When it's linear, you don't need to care about that. But I'm sure I'm now confusing you a bit. Um, you know, I don't want to confuse you. We need to do um, a break anyway. Uh, the last thing I'll do about this topic will be this. So just to show you the, the visual representation of this being done without an unpremolt and a premolt. So the way that would be would be that the merge node is the equivalent of a merge of a multiply. So, sorry, the merge multiply node is the equivalent of a premolt, and the merge divide is equivalent to an unpremolt. So, if I do this, I am multiplying my image. If I do this, I am dividing my image. So, a division is the same as an unpremultiplication, and a multiplication is the same as a premultiplication. If you go to Photoshop, this will apply. If you go to Fusion, this will apply. In After Effects, especially, because After Effects is really bad at this. You need to really care about these things really, really carefully. Continuing uh, to work uh, on this, we've now learned pre-multiplication. I hope that's all covered. It's very important to learn pre-multiplication for the simple fact that color correction is incredibly important and color correction is the way you balance all the layers. So having said that, 
We're now going to talk about color correction. That's what I want to talk about. Um, not in complete detail, because obviously color correction is an art form and a science on its own. Okay, So keep in mind that we're going to talk about color correction, but it's going to be basic. Okay, It's just a beginner's thing. So first off, first things first, I want to talk to you about something that is really important. Now, Keep in mind, we are not going to be talking about uh, advanced stuff like aces or LUTs or color space. or We're not going to be talking about that today, okay? So that's too complicated for a stream, and it would take too long. We're just going to basically talk about the... It's like a small introduction for those of you that want, like, you know, a little bit of an intro for color correction. So I wanted to show you this because this is really relevant. Uh, one thing that you should know about Nuke because this is one of the biggest, biggest differences from Nuke to After Effects. So After Effects, as you know, in Photoshop as well, by default works in 8-bit, you know? And obviously we know that we have 8-bit, 16, and 32. The more bits we have, the better quality of the image and the better it is when you do a lot of color correction, okay? So if you do very heavy color correction, the more bits you have, the better it is. So, Nuke, by default, does not work in 8-bit, and that's why it's a bit slower than After Effects and other applications, although it's getting faster. Nuke works in 32-bit float, so it never compromises, and that's why it's used in film. There's no compromises. Nuke basically uses everything. You basically have the full spectrum of color, 32-bit float, which is more than enough. Just to give you an idea, Monitors these days usually only go all the way up to 10-bit. The monitor I have right here, so for example, if you look at um, if you look at uh, this monitor here, uh, sorry, this monitor in front of me, this is a 10-bit monitor. Um, so that's a this is a real 10-bit monitor. It's an SW320 from BenQ. That one is an SW321C, and that's not 10-bit. That's 8-bit plus FCR. I'm not going to explain what. 8-bit plus FCR is, but 8-bit plus, 8 plus FCR is basically compatible with 10-bit, but it's like a, like a fake 10-bit. And then on, on the middle here, this screen here, the vertical screen that I use for the comments so that it's easier to have vertical, and also I use for the, for the, for the node graph, that one is 8-bit only. It's a designer monitor from BenQ as well. So just to, to give you an idea of that, so obviously your monitors already have a limitation that they cannot show so much, but Nuke on the other hand can go all the way to 32 bit. And, and for example, look at this image. This is a high dynamic range image. And if I use the gamma slider, you've learned about the gamma slider on the viewer back in uh, Nuke for Dummies part one. And if I go all the way back to the slider here, you can kind of see that all the information is still here. So this thing has so much range that I can actually see the filaments of the light. And this is one of the advantages of using 32-bit float. Obviously, for you to use 32-bit float, you need to have the best quality of an image possible. Usually, cameras photograph or film in 16 or 12. Most cameras film in 16 if you use high-end cameras. Most of them also use 12. Some cameras film in 10. And then, of course, the shitty cameras film in 8-bit. So this photo is an HDR photo. So this photo has been done with multiple exposures merged into one image, and that's why it has so much range. So normally, why is this important? Well, this is important because each file has its limitations. So for example, notice how it is comparing an image that is 32-bit float or an image that is 8-bit. If I go one by the other, they look exactly the same. But if I gamma down, you see the 32-bit float has an enormous amount of range, and the 8-bit one has no range. Basically, it's clamped completely. So obviously, the clamped version of the image is going to be more difficult for you to do color correction and key and whatever you want to do with it. It's always going to be more difficult because you're going to struggle to try to use this in any meaningful way in your compositing, okay? So that's gonna be a problem. That's why I'm showing you this. So this is just to like give you like a bit of a rundown of how images look. So look, look at, for example, this image here. This was shot on an Alexa. 
This is raw from the camera. There's no color correction in it. It's completely overexposed. It's like ridiculously overexposed. But if I again use the gamma slider, the, the, the f-stop slider, you can kind of see that nothing is overexposed. I actually have every single detail of the street. It's all there still. Uh, and this is why Nuke is used in film, because Nuke is very powerful and it keeps all the images all the, all the time. One of the advantages of having Nuke is this. Like if I do a color correction on this image, let's say I put a gamma slide, a, gra a grade note here. You see, I can multiply down the image all the way so that it's not overexposed. And then if I put another grade node and I multiply all the way up again, you know, and get overexposed again, I can then put another grade node and then multiply back then again. So you see, it's non-destructive. Nothing in Nukes gets destroyed except if it's filters. We're not going to talk, talk about filters today, but if it's filters, then of course it gets destroyed. But the the thing with this is that you get, you know, I started with overexposure. I brought it down brought it up again, brought it down, still have all the information because Nuke is running in 32-bit float. So no matter what you do, it never breaks it. I mean, with limitations, of course. Even 32-bit float is, is you know, you can break it as well, but not that's beside the point. It's very difficult for you to break it. It's going to be hard, I think. So now that we have discussed this and had that out of the way, talking about how Nuke has, you know, how nuke yes i know about the black clamp i know we're not talking about clamps yet uh cereal don't worry and um, we will talk about clamps sooner so i'm just showing you broad strokes of things um so let's now discuss what exactly color correction is what it does and how does it work so i think the best way would be to just show you the two most important nodes that you're gonna most likely use inside of nuke's color correction so these two nodes. These two nodes are the most important nodes that you're going to use in Nuke. The grade node, which is very good for broad strokes, broad strokes color correction. That means that you are basically color correcting the whole image or maybe sections of it, but it's a more like brute force type of color correction. It's very broad. It's very rough. It doesn't have a lot of detail and it's not very refined. And you can clearly see that by looking at it. It's a very simplified node, you know. Uh, it's not a very complex node. On the other hand, the color corrector node, much more complex, much more complete, a lot more options, a lot more stuff that you can do with it. Normally, this is not, of course, a rule, but normally you probably would split these two things in two different categories, one of them being primary color correction, which is what we kind of think of when we are doing white balancing or just correcting an image or just balancing images between themselves. That is often what we usually call a primary color correction, where we are doing broad strokes on the whole thing. It's very typical in DaVinci to do that. Now, color corrector is more used, not, of course, you can use the grade node as well, but it's more used when you actually are doing like secondary color corrections, when you're pinpointing your color correction to a specific part, a specific tone, or a specific mask, or a specific area of the image, because the color corrector node has a built-in keyer. It has something that allows you to key things out of the image, you know, like not a, let me, let me rephrase you this. It's not a keyer, it's like, it's like a, a range finder for it. Um, Apologies for the interruption. Keep in mind, if you have a question for me for the break, you need to write question in caps lock in front of the comment, or you need to do a super chat. If you don't do any of those things, I will not ask or answer the question because I'll miss your question. So make sure you write question in, in caps lock and make sure you, uh, or you could do a, um, can do a donation to the channel by using the super chat, and then you can also get that question. So keep, keep that in mind that I won't read it if it doesn't have that. Back into the comp. So, obviously, you know, this is a nuke to dummies, you know, like, I'm not, please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not calling anyone dummy, okay? <laughs> I'm just calling you guys, you know, an experienced beginners, you know, so. So, obviously, if it's for dummies, I'm not going to go into much detail because obviously there's a lot more than this, you know, like if I go to the color corrector tab, 
you know, there's a ton of shit here. You know, we have also an exposure node. We also have an Instagram node. We also have a Ucorrect. We have a Ushift. We have a HSV tool, an invert. There's a ton of other things that exist here. A saturation, a contrast, a posterize. Like, there's a lot of other nodes here and other tools. We are now today only focusing on these two because these are the most important tools that you will find in color correction. And that is why you see clearly that Nuke knows that and they've made a shortcut. So you see color corrector is a C and grade is a G or G, depending on where you live. <laughs> I don't know. I'm Portuguese, so for me it's a, a, a G, but a G, G, but in I guess in here it's the G, I, I don't know, a J, G, G, oh, God damn it, this is too complex. This is not my native language. So before you write the comment that I've misspelled something, remember I'm Portuguese. I have a second language. Um, do you have a second language? <laughs> so before you do a comment, complain about that. So let's go back to this then. So remember two notes, right? So now let's talk about what they do. <laughs> let's like, let's maybe, maybe let's do that. So here's a beautiful ramp. I'll go into the image in a second, but this is a ramp, just basic, you know, like, Black to white, white to black, just a ramp, a completely normal ramp. I want to start with a ramp before I go to footage because I, I believe this is a bit easier to kind of go around it, I think. And so let's start by looking at what a, a, a grade node would do, okay? So if I look at a grade node and what does it do with that ramp? So I'm going to just get the ramp here and I'm going to get a grade node here. And I'm going to show you exactly what happens on the grade node and on the ramp. So I have the, the ramp and then I have a grade node after that. So there are black point, white point, lift, gain, multiply, offset, gamma. Now, what are all, why, what is the, all this bullshit? So all this stuff is different things that you're color correcting. So as a rule, not that it's mandatory, but the black point and the white point are usually... Not a rule, but usually they are more used when you want to match something. So if you want to match the white balance uh, from another image or you want to balance the dark shadows from another image. So usually black point is used for that for you to, you know, if you're matching to another image that has blue shadows, then you would put blue on the black point. If you want to call a correct an image, imagine that they've incorrectly filmed the image with the wrong um, uh, white balance, then you can use the white point to calibrate it back into normal again. So that's what those two are for. They are allow you to kind of like correct mistakes, correct problems. Obviously, keep in mind this is not mandatory. You can use it for creative grading as well. Then you have a lift. I'll go through them by showing you, don't worry. A lift is exactly like the name says, you're lifting something, okay? So basically, lifting means, you know, the typical image that looks very uh, washed out. When you're lifting, it becomes washed out because you're lifting the blacks all the way up. So that means it gets washed out. Not an offset. I'll talk about the offset. So you're only lifting the blacks, not the midtones and the whites. Keep in mind, that's why I have a ramp here. We have the darks. We have the midtones and we have the highlights. Highlights are the bright areas. Midtones are usually the skin tones, like our skin or gray or whatever is a midtone. Anything that is like not dark, not black, not white. And then of course black or shadows or darks, and as you want to call them, it doesn't really matter. And uh, so, so going back to this. Lift lifts the blacks up. Gain basically multiplies or exposes the highlights of an image. So anything that is bright will become even brighter. So that's what the gain is. Just like you see on a camera, if you put gain, it becomes more bright. Multiply is exactly the same thing as a gain. I know people ask, why do we have to? The reason why we have two is when we are matching to another image, it's always handy to have two of them because you can use one to get the tonality of the color of the highlights, and then you can use the other one to match the brightness of the whole thing. Now, the reason why there are two names is because multiple people use this application. There's actually three types of um, highlight exposure inside of Nuke. You have the exposure node, which we're not going to talk today about. You have the gain and the multiply. Now, the all three are the same. 
and you've seen the exposure node by me exposing on the actual, you know, on this thing here, which is the um, the slider of the of the um, of the highlight. Uh, sorry, the f-stop slider on the viewer. So the reason why there's three is three is because the photographers kind of prefer exposure because that kind of links to their kind of work. The video people kind of like gain because they're so used to video cameras having gain, which is a bit of an old school thing, but it still happens. And then, of course, we have the uh, multiply, which is a typical 3D artist, which just multiplies sliders around. So they're, you know, Foundry is just, well, not Foundry. This was created by Digital Domain. Digital Domain was just catering to artists back then when they've created this node. This node exists since version one of uh, Nuke. And since it was in Digital Domain, they were the ones that figured this out. So, and then of course we have offset. Now offset, just like the name says, you know when you offset a frame, you're basically offsetting that frame to another range. That's what an offset is. An offset, you're moving the entire color around. Not just the blacks, not just the mids, not just the highlights, but the whole thing. And then gamma is just affecting the mid-tones of an image. Okay, so enough of uh, talking. Let's just do some action, okay? So let's start by the simple part, which is highlights. Now, it's a shame that you cannot see my scopes here because I have scopes on my screen um, and it would have been so much easier if you could have seen them. But, uh, you know, like, I, I think I think it's fine. I mean, we can, um, oh, what I could, do? no, I can't, you know, I can't. Well, I, well, Nuke has scopes. I mean, they're not very good, but um, we'll try them. We'll try them. We'll try them. They're not, they're really bad. That's why I have hardware scopes here on my on my desk, because they're just terrible. Um, so I, I don't really know what the Foundry is doing with this, because, I mean, I, if the Foundry is listening, I love you guys. I love everything you guys do. I love you guys, but come on. This vector scope and this Instagram and this waveform, it's a bit of a joke, okay? Just saying. Da Vinci's one is much better. <laughs> Obviously, I use a hardware one on my desk here, you know, but still, I'm sure you could have done better than this. But hey, that's the, that's, you know, <laughs> that's beside the point. But I'm, I'm going to put the scope here because I think it's going to be easier for you to see it with the scope on. So I'm going to just like open this up a bit more so you can actually see the scope and you can kind of see the image. So look at the image here. Um, this is a waveform scope, which allows you to see values from 0 to 100. Actually, the scope goes 120 for some reason. Uh, sorry. So this is a ramp. And just look at the curve here. It's exactly like a, a ramp. We have a ramp of an image, basically blacks on here, midtones in here, and highlights over there. It goes all the way to 100 there. Notice what happens when I start messing around with the multiplication. As I multiply the image, notice how my whites in here become brighter. So the multiplication is nothing more than just affecting just the bright areas. Obviously, this is a curve, so it's also affecting the gamma, of course. It always affects the gamma, but it affects mostly the highlights. And so with this, with this part here, and you can also see that by if I go in here and I put exposure warnings, you can see the zebra pattern here on the exposure warnings, which is also very helpful if you want to kind of like see that. Um, so you can si kind of see that I started with with zero, nothing is overexposed. And as I start overexposing, you can kind of see that now that's completely overexposed. So now this, this is a zebra pattern. Reason why is that happening is that you see this line is the 100 line. And so my image doesn't go beyond 100 because it's being clamped overexposed by there. And the reason for that is because obviously Nuke's, uh, uh, you know, Nuke's targets and Nuke's guides, the way that they expose in the waveform is to try to show you an image that is ranged from 0 to 100, 0 to 1. They don't want to show you, you know, like, like multiple values above that because it's going to be a bit tricky. I'm going to just like, going to remove my exposure warning and just show you that. So you see exposure multiplies the bright areas. And if I put, for example, 1.5, and remember that everything in new can be decimals. So, so you see, I can slide it like here. You see, I can slide it like, remember, this is a beginner's course, so that's why I'm mentioning this. You can slide it, 
But you can also like use the mouse key and actually go f uh, up and up and go to decimals. And this is one of the advantages. I, I like this a lot because you can go really tight going up and down on the arrow keys. And you can also kind of like select multiple parts and affect multiple parts as well. So there are kind of a, c a couple of ways of doing this. Okay, so I'm gonna just going to put like 1.5 because I'm a bit anal about these things. And I'm just going to show you the let's 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 forever stop this thing about saying that the exposure uh, that uh, multiplication and gain is not the same by opening them both and doing the same thing with both of them so contender number one we have the grade 25 with multiplication of 1.5 contender number two we have the grade 26 with the gamma the gain of 1.5 so multiplication of 1.5 versus gain of 1.5 if i match them and look at them one by one, looks exactly the fucking same. So just to prove forever that the multiplication and the gain are exactly the same thing. Just wanted to clear that out because keep seeing people on the forums, oh my god, why is there a gain? Why is the multiplication? Oh, the multiplication is better. Oh, the gain is better. No, none of them are better. They're exactly the same thing. Just wanted to clarify that. So I'm going to go back to this thing. Rant is over now. So... So if you look at this, that was the multiplication, the highlights that I was bringing up, and you can see them on the vector scope. I'm going to bring this back to one. Now look at what happens if I go to ga gamma. Gamma is the midtones, right? So if I now increase the midtones, you see, notice if I increase, decrease the midtones all the way down, note, or all the way up, notice how my highlight still is one. So Nothing over 1 gets overexposed, and nothing below 0 gets lower than 0. So the gamma, just like I mentioned, only affects the midtones of the image. Obviously, by affecting the midtones, it also affects the other parts, but just so you guys understand that. So that's the midtones. And this is the best place for you to kind of deal with skin tones if you want to brighten the skin of someone. If you want to like deal with uh, a gray wall or a white wall or something that is not overexposed or something that is not black. And then the lift, if you look at the lift, notice what happens on the image. If you look in here, as I lower the lift, I get blacker and blacker and blacker. And you can see that everything is lifted down on your vector scope, on your, sorry, not vector scope, on your waveform. But as I go up, you see that I'm now lifting so much that I actually don't even have blacks anymore. I'm actually having grays instead. So that's what the lift is. The lift is affecting just the dark areas and it allows you to colorize those areas. So for example, imagine that I wanted to have um, a blue type of shadow, you know, like a blue, because a lot of times when on daytime, shadows become blue. So you could open up by pressing this little circle using the command key or the control key. Sorry, it went went up all the way to the other side here. Uh, and then in here, you could uh, effectively put a tonality to it. So obviously, you don't see it because it's very subtle. But you see how now I have a blue tint into my dark. So this would be the way if you want, if you're working on CG and you are expecting to kind of convert the shadow to a, like imagine if you're uh, comping a CG object on a daytime scene with a lot of shadows, then you're probably going to bring in some kind of blue tint into your shadows, you know. So that's kind of like, um, that's kind of like, like, like how that goes. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to reset this. Now, Now, looking back at this as well, I wanted to just show, because this is, a, of course, a, a very, very uh, uh, beginner's class. Notice exact, uh, as soon as I went to that circle, I'm going to just go back and put this to default. So anytime you want, you can right-click over a value and right-click and do set to default, and that goes back to default. You can also set to default the whole thing by right-clicking over the gray area, and then it sets to default everything. So you see, as I lift it, I could lift just one single color. If I want, I can also press the four button and then I can s lift individual colors by reds, greens, blues, and alphas. But if I want to fine tune, I can hit either hit the button and then I have a, a little circle wheel here to control this thing, you know. But if I really want total control, you want to do command or control uh, over the circle and then that opens up this little fella. Uh, we're going to talk about this fella in a minute, um, you know. So, yeah. 
Oh, I can see Sajel is here. Hey, Sajel. Sajel is my lovely moderator. Thank you so much for joining, my friend. Thank you so much for joining. Um, cool. Okay, so let's go continue here. So I um, I, man, time flies. I only have five minutes left, and I haven't even scratched the surface with this thing. <laughs> I think um, I think maybe perhaps I am going a bit too slow. Um, but obviously this is a nook for dummies thing. Um, please let me know if I'm going too slow. I can speed up, but. Obviously, as I mentioned on the beginning of the stream, there's no way we're going to finish today. No, we're going to have as many streams as we need to kind of get to that footage, the comp of the monster. As I mentioned on the beginning, my objective is still to comp that monster um, in the plate. So, um, so yeah, so don't worry. Okay, so we've now talked about lift. We've talked about uh, multiply. We've. Uh, I'm going to just put this to default. So that's like the midtones, the highlights. And now the last one I want to talk about is the offset. So the offset just moves the whole thing down or up. That's what it does. It will be easier for you to see it with a piece of footage. Now, left from this thing was the, the black point, which obviously is very similar to the lift, but it's a bit more harsh, you know. And obviously the white point, which is very similar to the gamma, but it's like merged with the gain. It's almost like doing gamma and gain at the same time. But as I explained a few minutes ago, it's more used, more suitable for you to call a correct a specific area or matching to another layer, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, so, yeah. Okay, cool. Now that we've talked about this with a ramp, let's now use an image just so that we can go through this thing effectively, okay? So let's start with this image here. This was an overexposed image. Now notice how my notice how my waveform is now different. My waveform has other values as well, okay? Because obviously the waveform is not just black and white, it has color values as well. If you prefer to just see the waveform in uh, in black and white, you could do that. Um, I believe so. Can't at least you should. I guess not. I, I thought oh, okay, maybe I'm. Oh no no, here we go. So yeah, you can just put luma, and then you just see the luminosity if you want to. Um, we can keep it with uh, with RGB, which is probably going to be easier, but for us to see the values. And this the vector scope here as well is. I have a video about these things, by the way. I have I do have a video on my YouTube channel about color correction which you can go through, uh, but um, the vector scope is just like a, a a profile view, a top view of where things are. So this image, obviously, as you look through this, you see yellow and reds and greens. Obviously, this image is mostly that color. Um, so, you know, as I start kind of like color correcting it, so if I put this to default and I start color correct, let's imagine if I go to my gamma here and I start toning down my gamma, Notice how I can move around my color around on this thing. So if obviously if I go to blues, it goes to blues. If I go to greens, it goes to greens. You can kind of see it on the vector scope here. But th this is not what I wanted to show you. Let me just uh, not go into that realm because this is going to be too complicated. So let's just start by looking at this image. Problematic. This image is very overexposed. So first things first. We probably would want to multiply down the exposure so that we kind of recover some of the highlights. That would be the first thing we do. And then if we want, we could also bring the gamma up so we can see it. Now, obviously, the problem with this is that, as you noticed, I am not really getting a beautiful image. It's not contrasted enough. The reason for that is because I'm lowering... There's so much overexposure that I'm lowering too much. And now once I'm lowering too much, I basically would have to pinpoint this part. By pinpointing, meaning that the color corrector most likely would be, you know, a better place for you to do something like this. But I just wanted to show you really quickly what the grade node would effectively do to an image like this. And let's, for example, look at this image here. Again, same kind of deal. If we look at this image uh, on this frame and look at the grade node, this is from a trailer I directed a couple of no, I didn't direct this one. I'm sorry. I was only the VFX provisor. This one I didn't direct. Uh, so this was a trailer I, I did for Far Cry uh, a couple of years ago. And so uh, half an hour is gone. So we'll do the break in a, in a second. So we, we'll do it in part two. But you see, 
I have all the detail here. I can still see all the sun and everything. And of course, in here, if I start multiplying it down, I can recover some of that sun back. But obviously, by doing so, I lose a lot of the range of the image. So obviously, I would then have to gamma it up. And then I would probably would have to still multiply it up a bit to keep some kind of contrast and then maybe use the lift to bring some contrast into the image. Now, obviously, this is not going to work very well because the grade node, as I mentioned, is mostly used for broad strokes. And so this is going to become incredibly difficult for you to color correct an image like this without the help of the color corrector or the help of a gray or, or the help of a mask. Okay, So the mask will also be a way to do it. Now, let's look at a more simple image, which would be this one here, which is not overexposed and it's not like that. So if we look at this image, which is already correctly exposed, and if we look at the waveform, nothing goes beyond one. It's quite balanced. So if we look at this, this is really where we can now do some work because it's already kind of balanced. And so, again, we can, of course, lower the exposure or increase the exposure without, of course, ruining the teeth and having, you need to be careful with that. But notice how I can now, with the gamma, kind of tone down. For example, if I want to reveal a bit of the of the, of the of the of the hair, I could do that with the gamma tonality. If I want to make her a bit brighter, I can do that as well. And obviously, it would of course be better if you had masks and if you had that kind of stuff. We'll go to, into that in a second. But you see, if I now open up my little wheel of color here and I bring in a gamma a little bit. I now could effectively change the tonality of my midtone. So, for example, let's say that we want to make it a bit more like a warm country. Typical, you know, typical Hollywood film where they think Mexico is everything is red on Mexico. I don't know why they think that. They think Mexico is yellow for some reason. I don't know. Or they think that Norway is very cold <laughs> for some reason. And so everything in Norway is always blue and everything in Mexico is always yellow. And everything, I guess, in... And the matrix is all green. <laughs> so this is effectively what I'm doing here because I'm affecting just the mid-tone. So you see, if you look closely here to the teeth, the teeth are just slightly toned to green because, again, like I said, I'm affecting just the mid-tones. Now, if I wanted to colorize just those teeth without a mask, of course, I could go in here into my multiplies and I could basically just figure out a way to do the multiplication, but because it's not overexposed, remember the multiplication works mostly better when it's above one. Now that we've went through the grade node, let's now go, go back to the ramp that we had here, which was this ramp. And now let's talk about the other node, which is the color corrector. Okay, so the color corrector is a bit different from the grade node, as opposed to it has a lot of these settings. Now, when I look at the two of them, I want to show you that. Oh, whoops, whoops, whoops. That's not what I wanted to do. So um, if you open up the grade node and you open up the color corrector, I know that at first glance, they kind of look different, but they are not that different. So, for example, you see here we have a master, a shadows, a midtones, and a highlights. Okay? So... Master is pretty much like this one, the grade node. It covers the whole thing. That's like the broad stroke. It's almost like the color corrector. Inside the color corrector, inside the color corrector, there's already like um, you know a color corrector, a grade node. It's almost like this. This top here has already functions from the grade node. Now the difference being that you see now for the first time a saturation slider, which we didn't have before. So, and then we have shadows, which are effectively what we talk about when we look at lift. So the shadows area is the lift, the midtones is the gamma, and the highlights or the multiply or the gain. So you see, the grade node was affecting things in broad strokes. You were only affecting the highlights or only affecting the gamma or only affecting the darks with the lift. Now, Inside the lift, which is what we call shadows, and I wish the founder would write here shadow slash lift, you know. Inside the lift, we also have the midtones of the lift, the dark area of the lift, and the highlights of the lift. We then have the midtones, and inside the midtones, we then have the midtones of the midtones, the darks of the midtones, and the highlights of the midtones. And then, of course, on the highlights, we also have the darks of the highlights 
the midtones of the highlights and the highlights of the highlights. As I was talking to you about the color corrector, I'm just going to open up a color corrector here uh, to show you. And I'm just going to like uh, put this to default to show you and put this open here. So as I was saying, when you look at the master, that means that you're affecting everything. So let's say that we are, you know, this area here, that's the darks, which is what we call the lift. Then in this area here is the midtones, and then this area here is the highlights. Now, you see here, when we talk about shadows, that means that we are talking about lift slash shadows, and that's the area in this section. Then we have the midtones, which is this section. Then we have the gain, which is this section. Now, keep in mind that inside each of these sections, like inside this lift, we would have the bright areas of the lift, which would be here the mid-tone levels of the lift, which would be here, and the dark areas of the lift, which would be here. The same goes for the mid-tones. We have the darker mid-tones, the brighter mid-tones, and the middle mid-tones. And that's why we have mid-tones with gamma and gain, so that you can control those two things. And then on the highlights, we have the dark highlights, which are really basically the bright gamma. So the dark, so basically, tweaking the lifts of the of the brights will be effectively the same as tweaking the highlights of the gamma. I know this is a bit confusing, but I'm trying my best. So that's what you have to kind of keep in mind. So when you are actually call it correcting this thing, you know, so if you go in here now and you effectively have this thing, let's say I'm going to go back to the other script because the other script has the this, the, the, this thing here. It has like the... Um, it has the waveform. So you see, when I'm here, when I'm above here on the gamma, yes, I can tweak the gamma. As you can see, I'm tweaking the midtones in here. And yes, I can affect the highlights just like I did on the, on the uh, grade note. But then notice what happens if I start tweaking the highlights of the shadows. Notice how I'm only affecting that area there of the highlights. Notice how as I'm doing the gamma, I'm only affecting that area there. Look look at this thing here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you with a curve because it's probably gonna be easier for you to see it with a curve. So look at this curve here. Notice how when I'm affecting the, you know, let's let's look at this. I'm affecting the highlights. So you see, notice how there's like a, a little bulge now on my light, on my curve here. The reason why is there's a bulge is because it's like I'm affecting just that area specifically. So this this node is much more pinpointed. The same goes if I if I go here, you see <coughs> I'm affecting just the midtones. And notice how the highlights are almost not affected and the darks are almost not affected. <coughs> Apologies for that. And notice how as I'm affecting this part, I'm only notice how I can bulge just the highlights. So you see, I'm only now affecting this area here and not the beginning. So the color corrector node is a method for you to pinpoint areas that you want to color correct. So it's much more pinpoint. It, it's much more subtle. It's much more small and subtle. So let me just show you an example of that. So And also, of course, we have ranges. Now, the ranges, if I press, you know, this is attached to the ramp. If I now press the button test, you can see what the ranges are doing, okay? So notice how now we have a type of name. And, and this is, of course, important for you to see on an image. So if I'm going to put a color corrector here, I'm going to show you what happens if I put an, an actual image here. So you see, if I look at the ranges here with the test, you see I get like these different colors. And this is a methodology for you to key in specific parts of the image, okay? So, so that's what this is. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to my ramp real quick. I have my ramp here. I have my color corrector here. And now just look at this bit here. Imagine that I want to tweak this because if I open up <coughs> the midtones, <clears throat> when you put this on the text, you see, like I always tell you, whenever you don't know something about Nuke, you just leave the mouse over it, and then it will show you. And you can kind of see it. It says there, you know, 
uh, black, gray, and white to show you the range being used. Green and magenta indicates the mixture of ranges. <clears throat> so, for example, if I tweak this curve here, I'm effectively telling Nuke that the range of my of of basically my highlights of my sh sorry my shadow should be different. So you see now as I tweak them, notice how I can make the highlights smaller here. You notice how I can make the darks bigger. This is for you to just pinpoint certain areas of the image for him to become the middle range. So if I, for example, put this all the way like this and I put it all the way like this, now I'm effectively telling him that actually the highlights go all the way to a mid-tone. And I'm telling him that actually the dark areas are actually going all the way to a mid-tone as well. So I'm basically flattening the image much more. This is just a test pattern, of course. So now if I go in here and untest, and then I go back to my color corrector. Notice what happens now when I start gamming up my mid-tones. You see, my, my shadows, Lo notice how, how, how I, when I increase the highlights of my shadows, do you notice the bulge here? I'm affecting this entire area, which is this area here. Now, if I go back to the ranges and I decrease that, notice how now, the bulge is smaller. And that's because the color corrector has this tool, which is almost like a keyer to for you to tell him what do you think is a highlight, what do you think is a mid-tone, and what do you think is a dark area. Now, I understand that this is kind of like really maybe confusing, and I understand that this is there's so much more than this, you know. And I know that you guys will always want more, but you need to take it step by step. This is quite complicated stuff. So with this information in mind, let's now go back to a script and go through a few things with the color corrector just to, so I can show you effectively what happens. Okay, so let's look at this image here, for example. So this image here, you can clearly see that it's from a short film that I never finished, <laughs> by the way. This is from a short film called Oak Lake, which I've never finished. And so these are my students. So if I use the gamma slider here, you can clearly see that there's a lot of highlights down there with the sky. There's even a blue sky, although the thing is completely overexposed. Uh, and if I if I uh, increase the 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 app stop here as well, I can kind of see that there is actually a lot of detail under the bed, and there's actually a lot of detail inside this cabinet as well. So. This was shot with the Blackmagic uh, Urza Mini Pro, so there's a lot of range on this thing. Now, if I wanted to call a correct and pinpoint this thing, I could have used a call a corrector here. And now, on the call a corrector directly, if I think, okay, that's a highlight there, right? So if I now go in and gamma down my highlights, you see I can now recover the brighter areas of my highlights, for example. And if I use the gamma, I can also recover some of those highlights and bring them now. Now, some of it won't be the highlights. Some of it will be the sky, which also will be on the mid-tones a little bit. And also, obviously, there's too much range there. The reason why it's, there's too much range is because this thing is not effectively picking it up because it's too broad. So for me to make it work a bit better, I need to go to the ranges, put up the text, the test, and now I need to open up my highlights a bit more. So you see my highlights in here, if I look at the values here, look at how, if you look at the bottom here with the red, green, and blue, when I over the mouse here, you can see that we have four of values. There's actually four of brightness outside. So, and my range is not really even going there. So I actually need to lower somehow, have more of my highlights being picked up in less of, of it. So it's almost like I need to increase my highlight range so that it picks it up a bit more and decrease my darks a little bit more so that I pick up less of them as well. So now if I go to my color corrector here, there's of course obviously a limit to this, but if I now start gumming down this, now you see that I'm also affecting the actual outside of the framing as well. But notice how I'm now really pinpointing my color correction because I'm now changing the highlights. But you see, notice how she's actually not really affected pretty much. If I if I go in here, you see, 
Her face is almost not affected. Obviously, I'm going too far. You see, I'm getting edges and I'm getting all sorts of problems. And obviously, you need to kind of be careful that the color corrector is very harsh. So a lot of times you will actually need to use masks and not just like using a color corrector or sometimes even you even using keying to pinpoint something like this. In fact, the best methodology to color correct those windows, for example, would be this would be this methodology. You know, if you want, I would actually put a keyer, you know, a keyer, which we have not talked about, but, you know, it doesn't matter. And um, a keyer automatically outputs an alpha channel. And when you look at this, you basically can pinpoint the range that you want the keyer to pick up. So, for example, let's say that we don't want any of the interior. And we basically just want the outside windows there. And we can go really broad and try to get as much of the mask as possible to try to kind of pinpoint this thing. Now, you can also range it at the middle, but I don't want to uh, offset that because that's not going to that's going to break it. So, but I need to kind of like harshen it a bit more. Obviously, I'm doing this a bit quick, so I would probably do this with a bit more finesse, okay? Now, I'm going to invert this so that I have the invert mask if you want. Well, I, it doesn't really matter. The, the grade node has the ability to invert itself, but now, if I look at this, um, I can now put a color corrector here. And, you know, the methodology on this thing would be something like this. I would use a keyer to try to pinpoint just that window, which is too, too bright. Then I have a color corrector. Now, notice how all nodes in Nuke have like this kind of like input, which is called a mask input. So... This would, of course, go into the keyer bit so that you can kind of get like some kind of keying into the mask. Now, remember, my keyer is set to alpha channel. And so inside of my color corrector in here, now effectively, let me just test this. If I go like this, you see I can like get the whole thing gone now. I don't even need to like affect the midtones anymore here. I can even reset this thing. It doesn't even matter. Now... The other thing as well is on the ranges here, you can kind of see that I'm masking with RGB. I can also mask the, uh, the, other, side, the other way around. I could just keep... I, I went too far. Sorry about that. So I can basically hit this button, which is an invert. Uh, sorry, I know, I know I'm almost in front of it. but So you have an invert button here to invert my mask. And then you have using the actual mask here. So notice now that obviously the better the key, the better the, better the key, the better you can actually take care of this. So now I can actually tone down my highlights and maybe even try to bring my highlights a bit better. Now, this key is a bit harsh. There's a lot of things you could do. You could actually put a blur, try to blur it or soften it a, a bit more so that you can kind of like try to get the color correction to be a bit more soft so it doesn't have so many harsh edges there. You see the blur is actually kind of helping. You can kind of go a bit deeper even and maybe put 10 of blur. And then as I go in here, I can kind of like now really lower it a bit more. And even, you know, I can go all the way down if I want to. But obviously I'm now breaking this part. But this would actually have to be on the keyer. I would have to open up that bit more or even mask it maybe. That could probably be one way to do it, you know. So maybe that would work better. So now I have more of the mask. Now, um, let's see here. Um, now I'm blurring it ever so slightly. And now if I call a corrected here, you can see that I'm now color correcting too much. Obviously, this is looking very fake because obviously this is now the blur is blurring a bit the edges. You know, it's a bit harsh, the blur. You probably don't want to go so much on blurring. And, of course, the outside color correction looks just fake because you're going a bit too far. So I probably wouldn't go that far, probably go that much. And then, you know, if you want, you could go into the midtones of this thing and kind of like remove some of that blue tint. So, for example, you don't, if you don't want so much blue outside, you can basically just like bring a bit less blue into it. So by putting like reds and I mean, there's a lot things you can do actually well sorry i was doing it in the wrong place and um, you can go in here and start filling around with the color you can also desaturate it if you want to so if i if i start desaturating it here i can get less of the blue outside so 
Obviously, this is just a harsh, harsh color correction that I'm showing you. And there's some problems like this thing here. But I'm just like trying to show you how the methodology would be of trying to recover something like that. Of course, the better the key is, the better this would work. The better the roto is, the better this would work. And obviously, then you can use erodes and you can use blurs and you can use softens to try to get the mask itself to work a bit better. Okay? So, so I hope this is kind of all understood. Now let's talk about... Let's just do like a little small uh, color correction here. A really quick one on an image. Not a, col my, not a color correction, but just to show you kind of the kind of things that you can kind of come up with by using, you know, a grade node uh, with all those kind of things. Like, well, bef even before that, let me just show you another example of this. If I put a color corrector into this image here, for example. So you see, again, the color corrector would be the best way for you to kind of like do fine tuning on certain things here. So for example, if I want to kind of change the midtones, I know the midtones are kind of these white b boxes here. If I put the test, you can kind of see that the midtone is actually being quite picked up. Um, you know, so I probably want to kind of like increase it a bit more. And so in here, you know, I could go to the midtone here and, you know, you can decrease the midtones and you can kind of see that I'm not affecting her. I'm just affecting the room kind of. She's still there, and the highlight there, if I go to the frame one, I'm just going to go frame one, so you can kind of see there's like a, a really bright area there, and you see my mid-tone is really not affecting that bright uh, piece of, of thing there that is existing there. And in fact, if I go in her and have her here, you can kind of see that I'm just affecting the room, and you can kind of see that on her shoulders. If I start tweaking just the midtones. I'm only affecting midtones. I'm actually not really almost affecting the face. So that's one way to do it. And then of course you can tint it if you want, if you need it to make it a bit more greener, if you need it a bit more warmer, a bit bluer. And you can kind of see that you see effectively, I'm not really touching her face too much. Now, obviously this is just fine tuning. And a lot of times you won't do this in color. You won't do this in compositing. In compositing, it's, a lot of times you won't be doing this kind of stuff you'll be balancing layers one by one. And, and I think we, we, we don't really have any time. We don't have enough time today to go through balancing of layers, but you know, we'll get there uh, on maybe part four or part five. I still want to finish that, that CG. Um, but effectively, you can literally work in Nuke, if you really want to call it correct something, you could work in Nuke almost like if it was a DaVinci situation where you would have multiple grade nodes, multiple color corrector nodes, and you would have multiple masks inputting. So for example, I'll give an example. Uh, you know, let's imagine for a, for a second here that I want to make her a bit more visible or face, you know. Obviously I could roto and do a perfect roto, but there's always ways of doing it in a bit a, bit a more subtle way. A radial, for example, could be a good way to do that using masks like that, and again, a grade node would input to a radial and you can literally do stuff like this. I can have my radial and maybe have it close to her face. And by having it there, I can now, let's say, you know, just an example, I can kind of like, uh, sorry. Oh, wait a minute. One problem I'm having here. Well, I forgot about one thing. Not do, doing the thing, the thing I should be doing. So you see, this is a 4K plate. Obviously, my radial should be also the same resolution. So I'm going to actually use a reformat node to have that resolution of that 4K plate, which is uh, this one, I believe. Uh, yeah, it is. And then I'm going to attach a radial to that, um, uh, to that uh, reformat node. So I have that there. And so now my radial is actually the same resolution as the plate. And so when I use it, I can now actually use it correctly. So that's that's the thing. You need to kind of remember that it does have to match the resolution. Uh, obviously, now this is a bit too much, but I'm going to not gamma so much. But you see, I can, I can brighten her face a little bit and gamma ever so slightly and then use the lift to lower it ever so slightly. And just that little thing already lifted the, the face a little bit. So 
Never underestimate the power of radials and, and ramps and all sorts of things that can really affect an image. Obviously, this, this radial would have to be tracked to her face. Never underestimate the power of a nice radial because the radial could be soft enough and subtle enough for you to just recover a little bit of the face, for example, without really affecting too much of anything else, especially if you make it a bit tighter, you know. Also, the same goes for using radials and using all sorts of those things. Um, you know, like like if I now disable this radial and if I go all the way up here, up there, never underestimate the power of using a grade node with a, a ramp and actually use it for color correction. So not always you need to do full, full rotos to actually do color correction, okay? A lot of times it's it's all ab about you really doing things that are subtle and and just using ramps and using like like radials and using all sorts of things to kind of like bring back something. So for example here, let's imagine that I want to darken just the area close to the camera. Again, I know that this is mostly a midtone, so I'm probably going to lower the midtone. Now I need to invert the mask so you see I can kind of like make a bit of a fake almost like for us for our eyes to just look at that area there so i can just like do this for example so you see now that's effectively lowering the light on the bottom area using a ramp so all these kind of things are are possible and there's a lot more than this you know i i i know that we're just scratching the surface okay i i really understand that it's difficult to get get far. It's difficult to get far because it's such a complex uh, complex uh, application.